before the time of Islam, the culture of the Arab, they call it Jahiliya, ignorance, the wild, crazy times. You take your five-year-old daughter into the desert and you push her into this hole that you have dug and you bury her alive. You can't get lower as a human being, much lower than that. This was their culture. If you know they have made a mistake, will you follow their mistake? If you know they have done something wrong, will you keep following them in wrong? Make your choice. Do you submit to Allah or do you submit to your culture? Lanky, blonde, green-eyed, 33-year-old man who instantly evokes comparison with the character straight out of Hollywood portraying the imagery of European Christians of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. He was born to British parents in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania in 1964. He was educated at a famous Roman Catholic monastic school called Ampleforth College and went on to study history in London University. However, he left his education unfinished. Since the age of eight, his troubled mind was never satisfied with Christianity. He practiced Buddhism for nearly three years, though he never formally embraced it. His study of the Noble Quran immediately attracted him to Islam, and he embraced Islam in 1988. He has been a Dawa activist and presenting the truth of Islam since then. He has two was cornered at Hyde Park. He also delivers talks and lectures for Muslims and concentrates on the pure teachings of the saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. To deliver his speech on a very contemporary topic before all of us today, namely culture confusion. Brothers and sisters, please welcome Brother Abdul Rahim Green. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. We must begin by praising Allah. We praise Him and we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. We take refuge in Allah from the evil of our own selves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can misguide, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. Most certainly, my dear brothers and sisters, may Allah have mercy upon you, the best speech is the book of Allah, the Quran. And the best way, the best way, the best way to live your life, the best way to be, and in fact the only way to follow the religion of Islam is the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And of all the things in the religion, the worst of them are those matters that people newly introduce into the religion matters that have not been taught to us by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but people have introduced those things into the religion these are the worst things in religion 
And these new things that have been brought into the religion, practices, attitudes, and beliefs that were not practiced and believed in by the Prophet wasallam and his companions, it is called in Arabic, Bid'ah. This is what the Prophet wasallam called it, Bid'ah. Innovations, religious innovations. And all, Kulla Bid'atin Dalala, all of these newly invented matters in the religion, they are Dalala, which means they are misguidance. They are going away from the straight path, the Sirat al Mustaqeem. And everything, my dear brothers and sisters, that goes away from the straight path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for us, it is only leading in one other direction. It is not leading to the direction of paradise. It is not leading to the direction of eternal success. It is leading to the direction of the hellfire. And thus today's topic, my brothers and sisters, is so important. It is so important to our situation as Muslims today. We have called it culture confusion. Because most Muslims today, it seems to me, what they are following is not so much Islam as their culture. And this is particularly evident in a place like England, where of course I live and I work, where most of the Muslims are immigrants. They're not natives in the sense that, like I, in a, in a, although I was born in Tanzania, but I suppose I'm a native in a sense. My ancestors came forth for many de generations from that land. Most of the Muslims in the United Kingdom, and of course most of the Muslims in the United States of America, are immigrants. And this culture confusion is particularly pronounced in a place like England. But it exists everywhere else as well. But the environment of the United Kingdom and the United States of America really allows us, it magnifies it. It highlights the issue and the problems with Muslims who are Muslim because of culture, not because of conviction. They're Muslim because of tradition, not because of learning and studying and reading and understanding and comprehending. Islam is not a family heirloom that you pass down from generation to generation. It is not that. Islam is a guidance that has been revealed by Allah, the all-knowing and most wise, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of you and the creator of me. He subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most high, knows us better than we even know ourselves. And in his mercy, in his mercy, in his kindness to us, he has sent down guidance in the form of the Quran. And he gave us a messenger, a human being like us, a man who ate food and breathed air and who was born and who died and who had desires and who forgot things and who made mistakes. A human being, but a very special human being, the most honest and the most truthful and the most trustworthy and the most sincere and the one with the most high and noble character. This of course was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And all of the messengers are human beings. As the Quran quite clearly tells us, if there were angels walking and living on the earth, then Allah would have sent to them an angel. But it is humans. So Allah gives us a messenger who is a human being. Why? There is an important wisdom behind this. The reason is, my brothers and sisters, is because psychologically, and Allah understands the mind, 
because he is the creator of it subhanahu wa ta'ala psychologically the human being will say oh well you are an angel and you are telling me not to do this and not to do that and that I should do this and I should do that that is very easy for you to say because you are an angel you don't have desires like me you don't need to eat like me you don't change in wisdom and understanding like me so therefore we would have so many excuses not to follow what that angel is teaching us because he will never represent a living example but because Allah has chosen and made the prophets human beings the messengers are human beings that means we human beings can follow their example we don't have an excuse we have a physical example in front of us of a human being who is behaving in a certain way that means that we know psychologically that we can also follow that example maybe not to the same degree but certainly we can follow that example this is the wisdom of Allah sending the messengers as human beings and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was one such human being and he is the physical example he is the practical example for us of how we should worship Allah he is and his example is and his life is in reality Islam it is the sunnah the way the teachings the approvals of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that constitutes the basis of our worship and our life as Muslims this is very important to understand because to be a Muslim means that we are submitting ourselves we have surrendered ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to my desires not to my culture not to my parents not to my tribe not to the ideas prevalent in society no being Muslim means I willingly choose to obey Allah and submit myself to God and how do I do that by following the example of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him this is the essence of Islam brothers and sisters this means Islam is what we can call tawfiqiyya it is based upon guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we cannot invent for ourselves and imagine for ourselves how to worship Allah you can't do that it is not permissible worshiping Allah is based upon the guidance of the Quran and the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this is the case with every other prophet and every other guidance that Allah gave that is the case with the guidance that Allah gave to Isa ibn Maryam to whom Allah sent the Injil but the religion of Isa was Islam the same religion as the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the guidance that Allah gave to Musa to Moses was in the form of the Torah this was the book that Allah gave to Musa but the religion that Musa followed and the religion that he taught his people to follow was not different in its essence it was also Islam willing submission to the will of God so the guidance of all the prophets was based upon this and Allah also sent guidance to Ibrahim alayhi salam and Allah mentions Prophet Abraham Prophet Ibrahim a lot in the Quran in fact he is mentioned my dear brothers and sisters as a ex great example and a very important example for us to follow in fact the Quran tells us who abandons the way of Ibrahim except a person who has lost their mind who would abandon the way of Ibrahim Ibrahim Hanifan the one who surrendered himself to God and who followed the natural religion submission to God 
In fact, the Prophet wasallam told us that every child is born upon the fitrah, Hanifan, naturally inclined to worship Allah alone. It is only their environment, their environment that takes them away from that. It is the influences from outside that take them away from that nature upon which they were born. And that's why I want to go back now to culture. What is culture? When we say culture, what do we mean? Actually, from my research, there is no easy definition of culture. Culture is the things that people do, the things that people believe, the customs that people follow. It is in fact the social and physical environment in which people live. This is culture. Culture can be good and culture can be bad. The criterion or the means that we should judge our behavior, therefore is not as Muslims based upon culture. It is not based upon what the people around us do. It is not based upon what my mother and father and my grandfather it is not based upon what the people happen to be doing around us and what is normative behavior amongst them. No, that is not what our religion is based upon. The religion of Islam and being a Muslim is based upon what we have already said. The guidance from Allah in the Quran and the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the basis of being Muslim and this is the basis of Islam. Now some people will say, are you telling me that my ancestors are misguided? Are you telling me that my father and my grandfathers are wrong? Well, in response to this, I will ask you, are you telling me that your father and your grandfathers are infallible? That they could make no mistake? That they could not possibly in any way fail to misunderstand Islam? Are you telling me it is impossible that they have misunderstood or misrepresented something from the religion by mistake? If you know they have made a mistake, will you follow their mistake? If you know they have done something wrong, will you keep following them in wrong? If that is your choice, how can you claim to be Muslim? If you know that what your ancestors are doing, if you know that what your culture teaches is against the teaching of the Quran and is against the teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what does it mean Muslim? What does the word mean Muslim? Do you submit to Allah or do you submit to your culture? Make your choice because believe me, brothers and sisters, no prophet came to his people except they said exactly this. We are following the way of our ancestors. Read the Quran. I invite you, read it. But you see, that's the problem. No one bothers to read the Quran. No one bothers to study the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first word that Allah revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Iqra, read, read in the name of your Lord who created you from a thing that clings. Read and your Lord is most generous. He taught mankind by the use of the pen, that which they did not know. Yes, the pen, qalam, writing, reading. And yet how many people have read the Quran? How many Muslims have read the Quran? And I don't mean, and of course, I want to make an important point here. Reading the Quran in Arabic is an act of virtue for which you will be rewarded even if you do not understand it. I in no way, shape or form am, in, am discouraging or intend to discourage anybody from learning to read the Quran in Arabic. It is in fact only the Quran in Arabic. Once it is translated, it is not technically the Quran anymore. It is the speech of Allah in Arabic. However, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, 
الف لام ميم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الف لام ميم this is the book لا ريب فيه without doubt هدى للمتقين it is guidance for the pious people it is guidance but you know people have a habit I think it's a habit they have in India they wrap the Quran in cloth and they put the Quran high 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 up on the highest shelf that they can find this is what they do and they say we are honoring the Quran yet in the house there is the TV low low down but what is on the TV there it is there's the Qibla it's not Mecca there's the Qibla the TV Bollywood the movies the music the Haram is taking place in the house and the Quran is high up what is in the Quran they have no idea what does the Quran say they don't know they never read it they never studied it and these by the way I'm not talking only here about illiterate people we're not only talking about people in the countryside who are farmers who can't read or write if there are any of those people who cannot read and write left some of these are people who are engineers IT consultants professionals they spent years and years three four five years in university in college studying stuff that even if I look at the title Java 1.3 this and that language I don't know what and I even looking at the title gets my head confused yet they can open it and tell you what it's about yet the Quran they have not even read the Quran from cover to cover and they call themselves Muslim they do not understand and when I say they read it they didn't read it in a language they could understand they have not even read the Quran in a language that they can understand. And what they know of Islam is the few things that their parents have taught them. And so they look at Islam as something that is part of their culture, like they eat a certain type of food. For example, you see, that's culture. Culture, what is it really, if you look at it, in its original form, culture is usually a type of systemized way that human beings develop in order to cope with their environment. That's why the food, for example, the food we eat is usually associated with our culture. And originally, of course, the food is based upon what we could get from the land around us. So the flavor of the food, the taste of the food, the style of the food is based upon what is available. In other words, our culture is influenced by our geography. Whether it is the physical geography, the trees, the plants, the amount of water, so on and so forth. Or it may be the political or social geography. For example, many people's culture is something that is a product of one group of people or one caste of people imposing their authority on another caste of people. Their culture may be based upon that. A system of control. It may be based on a control system like feudalism in Europe or for example like the caste system in India is a form of control. It is how the Aryans who invaded India controlled the natives. They did this through their culture, through their religion. It is a control system. Similarly, we find this is the case in many cases, a type of control system. So our culture develops from that. How do I behave? What is my attitudes? If I am, for example, an untouchable, I have to behave in a certain way. If I'm a peasant in feudal Europe, there is a certain attitude. I have a certain culture. So this originally, of course, these things have changed in Europe and in India. They, of course, they have changed as well. But these are things that stay with people. These ideas, they are very hard to remove. 
Some of them are survival mechanisms. It's, they are things that people develop in order to be able to survive in their environment. But other things from culture are not to do with that. Some of those things are, you could say, really misguided things. They are wrong things. They are things very detrimental and harmful to the human affairs. And I want to give as an example of culture confusion. And let's see how this relates to us as Muslims. Please, let's look at ourselves. We need to be honest. We Muslims need to look at ourselves. Sometimes it's very nice, we go to a talk, and we love to hear someone give a talk where we are attacking another religion. You know, maybe it makes it feel, we feel better about ourselves. But being Muslims, we should look at ourselves. Let's take an honest look at myself. Let you take an honest look at yourself, at your life, at your attitudes, and see if maybe comparison between ourselves today as Muslims and another group of people to whom Allah sent a messenger, the Arabs. Let's look at the Arabs. The Arabs before Islam. Most certainly the Arabs before Islam were amongst the most barbaric and backward and primitive people. In fact, in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Allah looked upon the people of the world, the Arab and the non-Arab, and He hated them all, except a few people from the Ahl al-Kitab, a few people from the Jews and the Christians. Because the world was in such a state of corruption, such a state of disobedience to God, they were so far from the guidance that God had revealed. This was their condition, Arab and non-Arab. And the Arabs, when, as I say, when they are bad, they are really, really bad. And when they are good, they are really, really good. And in the time before the Prophet ﷺ came, they had sunk about as low as the human beings could go. I mean, low, this is how low you can get. How about if you think it's a good thing to take your five-year-old daughter, five-year-old, I mean five-year-old, that's when they are the sweetest, the cutest, they love you the most, they show you the most affection. You take a five-year-old girl, the night before you went to the desert and you dug a hole in the sand and you take your daughter and say, we're going for a picnic. Where are we going, daddy? We're going for a picnic, my daughter. You take your five-year-old daughter into the desert and you push her into this hole that you have dug and you bury her alive. And you go back to your people and you boast about it. You can't get lower as a human being much lower than that. You can't get more perverted than that. You can't get something more degenerate than that. These were the people to whom the Prophet ﷺ was sent. This is the stage that they had reached. This is the evil of their religion. And this was their culture. This was their culture. Along with the worship of idols and drinking and fighting and feuding. This was their culture, the culture of the Arab before the time of Islam. They call it Jahiliya, Jahiliya, ignorance, Jahil, ignorance, the wild, crazy times, Jahiliya. This was the Jahiliya, this was their culture. But you know something, brothers and sisters? They claimed they were following the religion of Abraham. You know the Arabs, they used to make tawaf around the Kaaba. When they made Hajj, you know they said, Labayk Allahumma Labayk. They used to say that. They used to pray to Allah. The Arabs in the time of the Prophet wasallam, they did not disbelieve in Allah in the sense, it's not that they denied His existence. They believed Allah was the Creator. They believed He was Al-Khaliq. Kul, the Quran says, Say, O oh, ask the Muhammad, ask these pagan Arabs, who's the Lord of the seven heavens and the Lord of the glorious throne? They will say it's Allah. 
They believed there was one God. They did not ever have an idol of Allah. They believed he was the creator. They believed he sent down the rain. He caused the crops to grow. He believed that he caused the people to die and he will bring them back to life. They believed Allah had an arsh. They believed all of this about Allah, but that did not save them. They were people who were far from Allah's guidance. They were people who used to worship things besides Allah. They used to believe that their idols were go-betweens and intercessors between them and Allah. And some of these idols were actually pious people who had died near the Kaaba, were buried near the Kaaba. And they used to pray to them thinking that they would be intercessors between them and Allah. And because of this, this was their disbelief. And they attributed, they attributed their culture, their customs that they had invented for themselves, they attributed it to Allah. How did it happen? How did it happen? Did not Ibrahim build the Kaaba? Yes or no? Yes. Was not also Ismail, Ishmael, Ismail, Ishmael, was he also not a prophet of Allah? Yes or no? Yes. So was not the religion of the Arabs at the time of Ibrahim and Ishmael, Ismail, was it not also Islam? Yes. But look what happened to them. Look how they changed. And when the Prophet ﷺ came to them, what did they say? Are you criticizing our ancestors? Are you insulting our forefathers? This is the religion of our ancestors and we're going to keep on doing what they're doing. This is our culture. This is our way. My dear brothers and sisters, what I'm asking you to look at today, look at your life. Look at what you follow. Look at your, what you call Islam. I wonder how much of your Islam is really based upon the Quran. How much of your Islam is really based upon following the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How much of it? There are so many things Muslims do today and we are famous all throughout the world. The whole people of this world, they know Muslims forced marriages. I don't mean arranged marriage, forced marriages. Forcing a woman to marry someone she doesn't want to. Forcing your daughter to marry someone she doesn't want to marry. It is not even in Islam, for anyone listening, in Islam it is not even valid as a marriage contract. It, in Sharia it is not valid. It is a condition of the validity of the marriage that the two people who are getting married agree. Yet, Muslims are famous for forced marriages. In certain parts of the Muslim world, we are famous for female genital mutilation. Even though the Prophet ﷺ warned against this. But people are so addicted to it because it's their culture. It's not the deen, it's their culture. We can find so many examples amongst the Muslims. And these are some examples but even more dangerous, even more dangerous than this, my brothers and sisters, are the things that we do thinking it is Islam, thinking that it's part of the guidance, thinking that it's the sunnah. And this is where shaitan, the devil, has really taken us for a ride. He's really fooled us. He's so happy. Because you know what? If you do something thinking it's religion, you'll never ever make tawbah. Why would you repent? If you think you're getting close to Allah, you'll never think to repent. You'll never think to say, forgive me Allah. If you make zina or you drink alcohol or you steal, you all know that's haram. Believe me, even the people who are not Muslim, they know these things are forbidden. Yes, true or not? Okay. So if you do these things, surely you will feel bad. You will feel guilty. But how about when you are doing something and you think this is from the religion. You think the religion teaches you this. But in fact, if you search in the Quran and you look in the actual Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will not find that they did this. And even if you look at the Sahaba, even if you look at the Sahaba, you will not find they ever did these things. In India and Pakistan 
and in Iraq and in Morocco and all over the Muslim world you find one of the things that people do is they visit the graves of the dead pious people they not only do they visit their graves first of all they build huge edifices over their graves even though the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said to Ali ibn Talib and he ordered him with two things if you see any grave higher than a hand span level it flatten it this is an authentic command of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if you know the Sunnah and you study it you will find it there if you're not interested in the Sunnah and you only want to follow your culture well that's up to you you're gonna meet Allah on the day of judgment and you will find out so this is what the Prophet said but don't you find the Muslims everywhere visiting these graves and making tawaf around them going around them circumambulating them and even subhanallah this is what I myself witnessed this I witnessed this myself when I was in Chennai we were in a hall giving a lecture the Adhan went in the masjid and next to the lecture hall behind the lecture hall was a darga a grave and there was lights and there was music and there was saying what's this oh it's the grave of such and such saint the Adhan went and none of those people went to the masjid not one of them they were so busy around the grave subhanallah is this Islam is this Islam and then they call upon those people thinking that they will be intercessors between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is different between that and what the pagan Arabs used to do to some of their idols in the Kaaba which were dead people is this not the same shirk that the people were doing in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa but you know what you'll never think to give it up you'll never think to give it up why because you think it's Islam you think it's the guidance but find it for me find me where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever taught any of his companions where Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman or any of the Sahaba used to do these things if it wasn't religion for them how is it religion for us if it wasn't religion for them how is it religion for us there is another thing we find that people do they gather together it's our culture you see they gather together on the 40th day after a person dies and they read the Quran together in a Jama'ah now I won't go into the issue of whether it is permissible to read the Quran with the intention of the reward going to the dead person or not in my point of view it's not my point of view there is some difference amongst some scholars from the earliest days about this I follow the scholars for example the Shafi's opinion it's not permissible to do that this is a bid'ah however some said but this is only they said a son for example could read it quietly alone for his parents they don't say that you should gather together in a jama'ah and you should have one man reading the Quran and you do this 40 days and then after one year and then another 40 days and like this and like this no one said this is part of the deen no one said we should do this but this is something we have invented I ask anyone, I challenge anyone, please find me where Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Masood, any of them did these things. Show me. Because if they didn't, how have you made it part of the religion? From where did you get the information? Did Jibreel come to you and tell you to do this? Did he come to you and say, yes, Allah now wants you to do this as a way to worship Allah? Please, brothers and sisters, please. You have to think and the problem is this if you don't study and you don't read and you don't study the Quran even there are people who are alims or they've gone through this course and that course but all they know is what their madhab says maybe they never read the hadith really they never opened Bukhari and read it and Sahih Muslim and read it this is the basis upon which our religion is the Sunnah the purified and authentic Sunnah so we have to ask ourselves it is very important because where are we going to go as Muslims where are we going to be as Muslims in this dunya and in the akhirah 
We are going to be before Allah and Allah is going to ask us. And before that, the angels will question us in the grave. We are going to be questioned about what we did. Now, some people are ignorant and Allah knows who the people who have an excuse. Yes, some people really, they are ignorant. They don't know. They de don't even know how to know. They wouldn't even know where to start looking in order to know who's a person of knowledge and who's not. Because they don't even have enough knowledge to know who's a scholar. They just find the guy with the long beard and the big turban and, you know, mashallah, he prays to Hajjud and he looks like, you know, his dad was a scholar. You know, inshallah, he's a scholar. I, I don't know. So they follow him. Maybe this person, inshallah, they have an excuse. They can't read, they can't write, nothing. They don't know. They're just doing their best. Allah knows they are doing their best to follow the right way. But how about the person who has a degree? How about the person who is educated? How about the person who can study complex subjects, biology, chemistry, information, technology, yet no. But the Quran, we can't, we can't understand the Quran. We can understand computer languages, but the Quran, no, no, it's too complicated. The Sunnah is too complicated. Subhanallah, too complicated? This religion complicated? Believe me, brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, this religion is not complicated. This religion is beautiful. This religion is easy. Yes, maybe if you want to study the laws of inheritance, it's a bit complicated. If you want to know fully the, all the details of applying the rules of zakah, okay. The mathematics may be a little bit more than what you can handle. It's more than what I can handle sometimes. But the religion, the basics, what is Allah, do you believe, made it difficult to understand the basics, to understand the essential aspects of this religion? And that's why I have to say, brothers and sisters, some people, they don't want you to read. When we say to you, read the Quran in a language you can understand, they say, no, Star, you mustn't do that. It's dangerous. You know who the people who are saying that to you? The very ones who know that once you start reading it, you will say to them, what are you doing? It's not in the Quran. It's not done by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just like the Christian priests, just like the rabbis, when Isa ibn Maryam came to them, ah, oh, you see, now he's challenging our authority. He's questioning our interpretation of the law. The same thing when Islam came. Do you think the Christian priest, the one who has knowledge, you think he doesn't know Islam is the truth? You think he doesn't know? Allah, he says in the Quran. The meaning of which is, Allah says in the Quran, those people of knowledge from the people of the book, they know Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is a messenger from Allah in the same way they know their son is their son. That's how they know. That is how they know. Believe me, no person who has knowledge of the Bible will pick up the Quran and read the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, except they will know definitely he is a messenger of Allah. Yet, they are defending their position of authority, their privileges, their control over the people. So they slander Islam. They lie against Islam. And I'm saying these are the people of knowledge. Some of them, they are ignorant and they just say whatever. They just say whatever people say and you know, they pick up this and that. No, I mean these scholars, they know. Why they don't change culture confusion? Because they're hanging on to their culture. It is maybe their arrogance, maybe their pride. So this is something my brothers and sisters is very important. I want to say something also that we should not misunderstand. Because people after the last lecture, someone came to me and said, Oh, you should have said this. I said, but I said that. How many times do you want me to say it? So I will say it, so I hope you will understand what I'm saying. Alhamdulillah, in Islam, it is considered everything from the world, the dunya is good. It's halal. The general rule is, everything from the worldly things is halal, except what Allah and His Messenger have forbidden. So the general rule is halal. What you eat, the food you eat, how much chili you put into your food, <laughs> the spices you use, the way you dress, the way you talk, the language you use, it's halal. The type of business that you do, it's halal. 
the type of car transport you use, it's halal. Generally, the rule is it's halal, except when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has made something and mentioned it is haram, or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has made it's haram. The general rule is therefore, in the things of the life, in the world, our culture, it's fine. Islam did not come to take away the good things. And the Arabs, they had some good qualities. For example, they were very hospitable, very hospitable, so friendly. Subhanallah, I have been really a recipient of some fantastic Arab hospitality in my life, including my dear friend, Sheikh Salim Al Amri. You know, he's a good person to be a friend of, especially if you like seafood. Especially if you, I went to visit him, oh my God, I've never seen such a big plate of seafood in my life. It was so big. And he made me eat most of it. Subhanallah, the hospitality, mashallah, the Arabs, they haven't lost that yet. Or at least some of them, alhamdulillah, haven't lost it. So the Prophet didn't say, give this up. No, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he told them to keep it and encouraged it in them. And their sense of honor in some things. He encouraged that. So Islam, Islam is not saying give up everything. The British, they have a sense of punctuality and being at on time and queuing. You see, orderly, being orderly. Is this a bad thing? No, this is a good thing. This is part of our culture. Does Islam say give this up? No. So in general, these things are not a problem. Alhamdulillah, what you eat, what you think, but you have a filter. You see, you have a filter, brothers and sisters. You have a filter. You know, like the strainer in the kitchen, when you're doing the vegetables, you pour, the, you pour it in the strainer to filter out the water and keep what you want. The filter for us is the Quran, the Sunnah. The guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. This is what we have to leave. So we use this filter. What, what is left behind, alhamdulillah, we keep it. And what the Quran and Sunnah tells us to leave, we leave it. But brothers and sisters, in order to do that, you have to know. You have to know what's in the Quran. You have to study it and read it and think about it. Deeply contemplate its meanings understand its meanings and then apply that in action in your life apply what the quran apply what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is teaching if you don't know then ask somebody who does know but in general alhamdulillah the religion is not confusing it is not difficult to understand of course we need scholars and i am not saying for an instant that we do not need scholars but we need true scholars True scholars who themselves apply the Quran and the authentic teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My brothers and sisters, I am only calling you, inshallah, to what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in His mercy has made it clear to my mind. From the first day when I became Muslim, I remember I went to the London Central Mosque where I now work, subhanAllah. I went there and I started to pray. And someone said to me, no, 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 you don't pray like this, you pray like that. Okay. Because I'm a new Muslim, you know, I said, Masha, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, gosh. I, I, I won't do this, I'll do this. And then he says, no, 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 you, you, you don't do this, you do this. There's another person. And then another one says, no, you mustn't wave your hands like this. The only reason that was done in the beginning, because the companions used to hide idols underneath their armpits. They were so addicted to idols and the Prophet told them to, you know, I can still do it and hide the idol underneath my, you know. So I said to myself, okay, everyone is telling me something different. I am sure Islam is not like Christianity, confusing. So what do I know? I know Allah, He revealed the Quran. And I know that the most authentic hadith have been preserved in Bukhari and Muslim. So you know what I did? I went to the library in the masjid. And I sat down. I didn't stop. I went through every ayah of the Quran about salah. I went through every hadith that I could find about salah. Then when someone came to me and said, 
oh, you should do this and you should do that. I said, really? Because I read the whole Quran and I read the whole of Bukhari and I read the whole of Muslim. I didn't see what you said anywhere. Can you show me what's your evidence? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, Jazakallah. <laughs> Thank you. You see, I didn't become Muslim just to follow some culture. I didn't become Muslim to become a Pakistani or an Indian or an Arab or, you know, a Moroccan or... I didn't become Muslim. I became Muslim to worship Allah according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why I became Muslim. Alhamdulillah. And that's my brothers and sisters what tonight I invite you to do the same thing. And it's only going to happen when you yourselves learn and study this religion. So brothers and sisters, please do that. That's my great advice to you. And then you will know and you will not have a culture confusion. Alhamdulillah, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk, tawbili. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, brother Abdurrahim Green, for your very elucidative talk on the topic culture confusion. Now we start our question answer session. I repeat, for your questions, kindly follow these rules. Let your questions be on the topic, be brief, and ask only one question at a time. Non-Muslims would be given preference if they come onto the mic over Muslims standing in the queue. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. My name is Atiya and I'm a bank professional. Sir, my question to you is that uh, basically I would like to tell you that I personally, I don't go to Darga, that is tomb, but some people around me go there. So if possible, can you please give me a verse from the Quran which says that the tomb shouldn't be higher than half of a hand so that I can, uh, you know, the support uh, my statement when this? Zakla? Barakallah. It is not an ayah of the Quran. It is a hadith. It's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a hadith. So that, that's where you will find it. But also I have to tell you something very important. Some people will say, well, prove to me that I can't do this. They say, prove to me that I can't do this in Islam. The person who says that has only with their words confessed their complete ignorance about what being a Muslim means. Because in Islam, you have to prove that you should do this. Not prove that you can't do it, it's the other way around. If you do an act of ibadah, you must be able to provide a proof. Not only that that act of worship is sanctioned in general, but it should be done in this specific way. Yes? Not only the act of ibadah in general, but that it should be done in this specific way. For example, let's go back to the example before. No doubt, it is an act of ibadah to love and honor the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa but we have been given specific ways to love and honor the Prophet ﷺ by the Prophet ﷺ. Also, for example, Allah has told us to establish the prayer. Aqeem salah But I will ask anyone here tonight, bring me from the Quran the details of how to pray. The beginning time and the end time, how many rakah each prayer is, what is the order of the standing, bowing, and sajda? Of what you should say in the tashahud? Bring me the details of any of these things from the Quran. You will not be able to do it. True or not? Yes. We only know this from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But if someone said to me, Look, the Quran says establish the prayer. And I dance around like this. Then I'm praying now. That's salah. This is Salah. I say, no, that's not Salah. This is, this is the Quran says, make Salah. This is what I call Salah. W will this be accepted? Of course not. Because you have to prove that Salah is doing this. You can't say, prove to me where the Quran says, I can't do this. Actually, it's the opposite. You have to prove that what you're doing is something that is ibadah, that's something that is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the system that Allah has given us. So I hope that answers your question, insha'Allah, sister. Jazakallah khair. 
Next question on the mic. Yes, brother, you can put forward your next question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. My name is Ejazuddin Surki. I'm a mechanical engineer by profession. My question is, how can the Indian Muslims be freed from the strangle of age-old culture? What remedies do you suggest? My suggestion, first of all, is we do have to understand that not everything from culture is bad. We do have to see what is good and what is bad, what we should accept and what we should reject. The only way we can realistically do that is when we really understand the Qur'an and we really fully understand the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. So as a simple start, for people like you, my brother, for people like you, a simple start is literally simply pick up a copy of the Qur'an in English or Hindi or whatever language you find most easy and read through it. Not because you can read the Qur'an and become a scholar and make fatwa. I am not saying that. Astaghfirullah. It's not up to us to make fatwa. We need scholars for that, of course. But what I am saying is only when you do that, you will begin to understand what is the culture and what is the Islam. Then also to read a good seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Like, for example, Raqiq al-Maktoum is a good seerah, mashallah, authentic of the Prophet ﷺ. To go through the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. When you do that, I believe you'll begin to see the scholars. And you'll begin to understand which scholars are basing their Islam upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and which scholars are just people who are not really scholars. They are just continuing the culture and sometimes even continuing and propagating the evil and wrong practices. These are the ones, unfortunately, who they do not like the Qur'an and Sunnah to be propagated because it means their position and their things will be challenged. For example, I, when I am driving to the hotel and back, some of the brothers told me that by the road there are kids with incense. And they put the incense in the car like this. And they said, this, these people are from the graves. They come from the graves and they sell this as a type of, it's a baraka or something like that. And you give them money. Now if you say to this one, this is haram, he will say to you, this is my livelihood. We make our money from this. Will he accept it very easily? I don't think so. The person who has vested interest and financial interest in maintaining the graves, for example, and all the thousands and thousands of people who come to the graves and give him money and pay him and, you know, he is going to be between, you know, you ask him and he will ask the saint and the saint will ask Allah. That's a big chain. Look at this. And bit of money in between. He is most of the time, he's not going to be ready to accept you say, no, I'm sorry, we have to knock this grave down now. Because this is what the Prophet said. He said, what are you talking? This is, you know, you, you a Wahhabi. That's it. That's the answer. Wahhabi. He's not interested. You could bring him evidences like this, you know, from here to here, up there on the right, the thing. Wahhabi. That's the only answer. Wahhabi, no, who cares what all I'm saying? Look at the evidence. Look what we are Muslim. Let's follow Islam. If I'm wrong, what I say, I will change. That's it. Believe me. If you prove me wrong, I will change. Bring me the evidence. Show me. So this is all we are saying. So we have to get used to studying the religion. This is the solution. Knowledge is the solution. Iqra, read. This has to be our culture. We have to be, have the culture of being readers, of being studiers, so much better than watching Indian movies and, you know, and all that type of stuff. So much better if we read the Qur'an, we study the hadith, we read the seerah, we sit with the good ulama, we listen to their khutbahs. This is what we need to do, my brother. We need to have a culture of learning. We need, and if you look in your history, if we look in our history, subhanallah, if you study the history of the Muslims of India, the history of the Muslims in the Arab world, anywhere in Spain, you will find when the Muslims, their scholars were many, and the 
culture was one of learning and knowledge, then the Muslims were very strong. They were very strong and very respected. And they had a fantastic civilization. But when we left this and we just begin to enjoy the dunya, and that's what we spend all our time, then we become weak. And we follow all strange things. And we become divided. So my brother, this is my suggestion to, to you and everybody, inshallah, to study the religion, inshallah. This is the way we will revive it. Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as -salamu. First of all, I just wanted to thank Mr. Zakir Naik and the people over here, all the speakers. Jazakallah khair. Uh, brother Abdul Rahim, just now you have uh, mentioned in your speech, culture confusion, that all prophets were human beings. That's a uh, wisdom of Allah. So that a common people can understand Allah's rules and regulation. This is essence of Islam. I just wanted to know that Quran was revealed by Prophet Muhammad and uh, Torah was revealed to uh, Musa alayhi salam. So also Tawud alayhi salam, Zubur. And uh, what about Isa alayhi salam? He was not a common man, as do I think, because he did not have a father. And uh, was he buried? Uh, according to uh, the Christians, he was crucified. Can you shed light what Allah wants to show us till the end of this uh, world that one of the prophet was born without a father and in the end there was some problem about the burying and the crucifixion. Can you shed light about this? Uh, very briefly, although there is going to be a, a lecture in these days about the crucifixion of Jesus, so I don't want to go into that subject. But concerning the issue, the specific issue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has showed us His power to do whatever He wills and to create in whatever way He wills. First of all, yes, it is true that Isa alayhi salam, may God's peace be upon him, had no father. Allah created him miraculously in the womb of Maryam. He said, be and Isa was. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also created Adam with no mother and no father. Yes. And he also created Hawa, Eve, from a man, but not from a woman. Yes. So in these things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing his complete power and control over the creation. It does not make Adam or Hawa or Isa any less a human being. They are still human beings with all the attributes and the qualities of human beings. Despite the fact that they have been created in a very special way, they are still human beings. Zakalakha. Thank you, Brother Abdurrahim Green. Zakalakha.